My name is Daniel Drucker, and I'm delighted to share our work that supported the 2021 Canada Gairdner Award. These are my disclosures. I have had a number of interactions with companies in the space that have worked with us to develop multiple new therapies. Now, this is about a 40 year summary of our work on glucagon-like peptides that has resulted in the development of multiple new classes of therapies for type two diabetes, for people living with obesity, as well as for short bowel syndrome. This work could not have been done without the tremendous help from many dozens of outstanding trainees. Their names are shown here. We also benefited over the many years from wonderful collaborations, both within the University of Toronto, within Canada and the United States and internationally. The translation of these therapies to new medicines, of course, required the efforts of thousands of clinical investigators, nurse practitioners, study coordinators, and companies that supported this work. Let's get started in regard to the history. We owe our thanks to Kay Lund working with Joel Habner and Dick Gudman, who cloned the anglerfish cDNAs encoding proglucagon, identifying for the first time a novel glucagon-like sequence termed glucagon-like peptide one. This enabled the cloning of the mammalian cDNAs and genes by Joel Havner, as well as Graham Bell. And in the mammalian sequences, we could detect the presence of two glucagon-like peptides, GLP-1, and an unknown peptide sequence, GLP-2. It became clear from work done by Svetlana Mozhov using intestinal extracts, as well as simultaneous studies that I did using transfected proglucagon cDNAs, that there were multiple molecular forms of GLP-1, and this became clinically important in the years to come. I set about to determine what might be the actions of GLP-1, examining the bioactivity of multiple GLP-1 forms in different cell lines. And here you can see the experiments that I did using islet cell lines, demonstrating that truncated forms of GLP-1 increased cyclic AMP formation in beta cells, stimulated increased insulin gene expression, and enhanced insulin secretion, notably in a glucose-dependent mechanism of action. We rapidly became aware of the importance of dipeptal peptidase 4, a ubiquitous enzyme for the control of GLP-1 and GIP degradation. There was some concern at the time that this molecule, which was a target for oncology therapies due to its ubiquitous expression in the hematopoietic system, there might be some difficulty, it was thought, targeting this mechanism for the treatment of a metabolic disease. But you can see here the phenotype of the DPP-4 knockout mouse generated by Wagman and Marguet and colleagues and studied by us in Toronto, there was a remarkably improved glucose homeostasis, enhanced levels of GLP-1 and GIP. And on the right-hand side, when Tanya Hensadia asked which of the substrates for DP-4 were important for this glucose control, it turned out to be all GLP-1 and GIP as the glucose control in this mouse was eliminated in the context of elimination of the incretin receptors. Now, we were hopeful that there would be some cardioprotection attributed to reduction of DP4 activity, as when we treated wild-type mice with DP4 inhibitors, we saw improved cardiac phenotypes in the context of ischemia. And here you see the same types of experiments in DP4 knockout mice that exhibit improved survival 
reduced infarct size and better ejection fractions when they had experimental coronary artery ligation. However, the results of the cardiovascular outcome trials with TP4 inhibitors presented a glass half full, glass half empty scenario. The glass was half full because it was wonderful to note the cardiovascular safety of these agents in high risk populations with established cardiovascular disease. However, we soon learned that SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists actually reduced the rates of cardiovascular events. Hence, the DP4 inhibitor data was not quite as impressive as we had hoped relative to these other new classes of medicines. Now, why did this cardiovascular uh, phenomenon be so exciting in mice and rats and yet so challenging in humans? As noted on the left, we really had a very good understanding of the glucose control mechanisms. But on the right, we are reminded on how complicated cardiovascular disease and inflammation might be, as there are dozens of DP4 substrates that control inflammation and atherosclerosis. And as well, this is a cell surface molecule widely expressed on endothelial cells and immune cells. So understanding the translation of changing DP4 activity from mice to humans was clearly much more challenging than the glucose story. In fact, we went back to look at the plasma levels of circulating cytokines in people studied in the TCOS trial, the citagliptin cardiovascular outcome trial. And you can see here that whether or not one was on citagliptin or not, there was really no meaningful difference in circulating levels of inflammation biomarkers. And so if one did these experiments in mice as we did, we saw consistent reduction of inflammation in mice treated with citagliptin, but we do not see the same consistent reduction of inflammation in people with diabetes treated with citagliptin, and perhaps providing a clue as to why it was so difficult to translate the positive cardiovascular outcomes from mice to humans. Now, we were fascinated by the GLP-1 pharmacology and set about to understand what the endogenous physiological actions of GLP-1 might be. We carried out these experiments using antagonists to block GLP-1 action, as well as generation of GLP-1 receptor knockout mouse spearheaded by Louise Crokey and colleagues. And several surprises were immediately apparent when we studied this mouse. Notice that the fasting glucose was elevated in mice with no GLP-1 receptors. Now, we had long thought of GLP-1 as a postprandial gut hormone, but it was evident that GLP-1 was required for optimal glucose control 24 hours around the clock. Surprisingly, the first GLP-1 receptor agonist developed for pharmaceutical use successfully was derived from the venom of a poisonous Gila monster, Heloderma suspectum. This protein named Exendin-4 was isolated by John Eng, and Eugene Chen in our lab cloned Exendin-4 cDNAs from the lizard salivary gland, as well as from the pancreas, and demonstrated that the pancreas had only cDNAs encoding proglucagon, whereas a unique Exendin-4 cDNA was expressed in the lizard salivary gland. Despite all the efforts of the pharmaceutical industry to develop human GLP-1s with great alacrity, the lizard venom GLP-1 analog, namely exenatide, made it across the finish line and became the first GLP-1 receptor agonist approved first in April 28, 2005. Now, I was fascinated by the concept that perhaps one could develop a once weekly diabetes drug to really help in the quality of life for people with type two diabetes. At that time, people needed to take tablets once or twice or three times a day. Insulin injections needed to be administered multiple times a day. And although other therapies had once weekly 
uh, therapeutics, the field of type 2 diabetes did not. And I was very excited to be the principal investigator of the first duration one trial, namely comparing once weekly exenatide with twice daily exenatide. And you can see very effective control of blood glucose and body weight, enabling the approval of exenatide once weekly as the first ever therapy that could be administered once weekly for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. Now, of course, there's been tremendous progress in the field, and we now have multiple once weekly therapies approved worldwide, as shown here. These are very effective agents. If we take a look at head to head studies demonstrating effective glucose control, we are really getting robust glucose control, really making attainment of goal much more achievable than with earlier historical agents. A big bonus in this field is clearly the simultaneous reduction in body weight. And with the newer agents approved for type 2 diabetes, we are seeing mean reductions in body weight of 5 to 6%. And some of the better responses even approach 10%, which is really exciting for type 2 diabetes therapeutics. There's been tremendous innovation in this space, including the development of a once daily oral peptide therapy, namely once daily oral semaglutide, which is very effective in head-to-head -head trials, as good or better than most of the other available oral diabetes therapeutics. This is quite a technical achievement when one considers the hostile environment of the mucosa of the gut with a low pH, with all kinds of mucus and enzymes ready to digest peptides. And so we can look forward, I think, to more innovation in this space. Now, how does GLP-1 really work in humans? What are the important determinants? There's been a big interest in understanding whether there are portal glucose sensors that will convey special signals from gut-delivered GLP-1. There's been interest in examining variation in the GLP-1 receptor as a key determinant of GLP-1 action that differs perhaps from one individual to another. And we had the opportunity recently to actually compare people with semaglutide administered either orally or through injection and ask what really matters for glucose control and body weight reduction. And you can see here very clearly that it's the circulating levels of semaglutide that determine the A1C reduction and body weight reduction in this large population analysis of thousands of individuals. So there may still be a small role for these other determinants that I mentioned, but circulating levels of the drug drive the pharmacodynamic efficacy. So the cardiovascular outcome trials for GLP-1 receptor agonists have been much more exciting than for the DP4 inhibitors and have generally shown a reduction in heart attacks, strokes, and all-cause mortality. So how is this achieved? We've tried to examine these questions using wild-type and knockout mice. And here you can see studies that John Usher did in activating the cardiomyocyte GLP-1 receptor. And remarkably, we still see preserved cardioprotection, preferential preservation of ejection fraction, and notably markedly enhanced survival of these mice. So it's clearly not the small numbers of cardiomyocyte GLP-1 receptors that convey this cardioprotective action. And perhaps it's an indirect mechanism or maybe other cells within the heart, such as blood vessels, that are important for the cardioprotective actions of these medicines. Now, we were surprised when we studied the human heart that unlike the mouse, which has predominant atrial expression of the GLP-1 receptor, the human heart has detectable GLP-1 receptor mRNA transcripts in all four chambers. 
And this again highlights the caveats in the field of extrapolating data from mice to humans where there are often key biological differences. We recently had the study to revisit the potential mechanisms underlying the potential reduction of atherosclerosis, which many of us feel is an important attribute of GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy. Here I'm showing you very recent studies by Brent McLean, who asked a very simple question. Are immune cells or endothelial cells key sites of GLP-1 receptor expression that are targets for the anti-atherogenic activity of GLP-1 receptor agonists. Brent treated mice with experimental atherosclerosis with semaglutide, and these mice either were wild-type mice or we inactivated the GLP-1 receptor in the TI2 positive population of endothelial cells or immune cells. And remarkably, we don't seem to require the GLP-1 receptor in immune cells or in endothelial cells to have the benefit of GLP-1 on reduction of atherosclerosis. So we're still searching for the cell types that are essential to convey this anti-atherogenic benefit. Well, what about modification of risk factors such as dyslipidemia? We know that GLP-1 receptor agonists powerfully reduce triglycerides in the postprandial state. How does this happen? There are no GLP-1 receptors on enterocytes. We envisioned that there might be neural communication to the enterocyte to transduce these anti-secretory signals. However, when we inactivate the GLP-1 receptor in the WINT1 domain or in the FOX2B domain, virtually inactivating the vast majority of central nervous system, enteric nervous system, or autonomic neural GLP-1Rs, we still see robust reduction of triglyceride secretion in mice that are lacking all of these neural GLP-1 receptors. So how GLP-1 controls postprandial triglyceride secretion from the enterocyte is still a mystery to us. We have made tremendous progress in the field of understanding how GLP-1 reduces food intake and body weight. There are clearly multiple distributed populations of GLP-1 receptors that are capable of transducing these signals, and humans with weight loss secondary to the use of GLP-1 receptor agonists receive a tremendous number of benefits in improving their health significantly. We can see some of the progress in this field when one examines the phase three data from once weekly semaglutide with many people living with obesity experiencing 15 to 18% body weight loss. And in some of these trials, about 40% of people experienced a 20% reduction in body weight loss. So this is really encouraging progress in the field. Now, I've mentioned the complexity of the many different neuronal populations. And here's just one experiment from our lab that demonstrates the possible role of autonomic neuronal GLP-1Rs. On the left, you see body weight reduction in wild-type mice treated with dulaglutide, a once-weekly GLP-1 receptor agonist. On the right, you can see that mice with an activation of the GLP-1 receptors in the FOX2B domain within the nodose ganglia and autonomic neurons, they still experience weight loss, but it's not as great as the mice with populations of autonomic neuronal GLP-1Rs. So I think it's possible that despite the importance of the central nervous system GLP-1Rs, the autonomic nervous system GLP-1Rs probably also contribute some degree of the activity leading to reduced food intake and body weight loss. Inflammation is another really exciting target for GLP-1 receptor agonists. And we know that GLP-1 receptors are expressed in some immune populations, but it's difficult to find them. On the left, you can see most of the macrophage populations we studied don't express the GLP-1R, 
but we find abundant TLP1 receptors in a key cell population within the gut mucosa. This is the intestinal intraepithelial lymphocyte that has a canonical GLP-1 receptor that responds to cyclic AMP accumulation and transduces local anti-inflammatory actions. Now this makes sense because within the gut surrounding the L cells, we have bacteria, we have fungi, we have viruses, and many of the byproducts or metabolites from these microorganisms stimulate the L cell to increase GLP-1 secretion, which in turn communicates with these gut lymphocytes to reduce local inflammation. What's still unclear, however, is how GLP-1 reduces inflammation in many organs that don't have abundant GLP-1 receptors, or in fact, don't have infiltrating immune cells that are GLP-1 receptor positive. So still lots of work to do to solve this puzzle. We know that inflammation in organs such as the liver can be effectively reduced by treatment with GLP-1 receptor agonists. Here's a phase two trial with semaglutide in people with NASH, demonstrating very robust reduction of inflammation without worsening of fibrosis. And in fact, semaglutide is now in phase three trials for the treatment of NASH. But how does this happen? Is this simply reduction in body weight that reduces fat and in turn indirectly reduces inflammation? Well, Brent McLean has recently identified together with CK Wong, a population of immune cells within the liver that express the GLP-1 receptor, gamma delta T cells. And when we eliminate the GLP-1R in this population, we see attenuation of the antifibrotic effects of GLP-1 receptor agonists in mice, as well as attenuation of the actions of GLP-1 receptor agonists to reduce inflammation. So this is really exciting, and I think will be the focus of additional study going forward. Let's turn our attention for the last few minutes to GLP-2. We were aware decades ago of these interesting case reports linking glucagon-producing tumors to stimulation of bowel growth. When these tumors were removed, the intestinal hyperplasia resolved. Hence, there was really a concept for many years that something related to glucagon or produced by the glucagon gene might be a potent bowel growth factor. We reproduced these experiments in tumors transplanted into nude mice as shown on the left. And all of these glucagon producing tumors produced very robust bowel growth. In fact, we could easily double the mass of the small bowel in just a few weeks. Interrogation of the mechanisms underlying this observation revealed to us that it was glucagon-like peptide 2 when injected into mice that was a powerful gut growth factor. And this set the stage for a series of investigations examining how useful GLP-2 could be to enhance nutrient absorption and to uh, be potentially effective in experimental models of short bowel syndrome. We were really excited when after more than a decade of work and several phase three clinical trials, we obtained the results of the pivotal phase three studies examining tadeuglutide, a degradation resistant GLP-2 analog characterized in our laboratory. We can see here that people with short bowel syndrome treated with tadeuglutide we're able to markedly reduce the number of days required to receive parenteral nutrition. In fact, in the real world, it's evident that probably more than 25 to 35% of people with time can come completely off parenteral nutrition when treated with tadeuglutide. I've been gratified to review many of these stories of individuals 
treated with parental nutrition. One can see videos on the internet or stories like this of Ava, one of the first children with short bowel syndrome to be treated with teduglutide, which as we now know, is approved for pediatric indications as well as adults with short bowel syndrome worldwide. And this is an extremely gratifying example of the importance of bench to bedside research in the field of glucagon-like peptide action. So I hope you've enjoyed this brief tour that started really in the 1980s with the cloning of the cDNAs and genes, the isolation of GLP-1 and GLP-2 sequences, the discovery of GLP-1 action and GLP-2 action, and then many important clinical trials leading to approval of DP4 inhibitors for the treatment of type 2 diabetes, GLP-1 receptor agonists for the treatment of type 2 diabetes, GLP-1 receptor agonists for the treatment of obesity, and of course, GLP-2 receptor agonists for the treatment of short bowel syndrome. I haven't discussed the exciting recent develops, developments in the coagonist field, such as molecules that are GLP-1 GIP coagonists, such as terzepatide, nor the ongoing clinical trials in the field, but let's just highlight what the future might hold. We know that these uh, medicines are increasingly useful for people with diabetes and obesity. And I think the success of these therapies in the GLP-1 field is underpinned by the robust reduction in cardiovascular death, heart attacks, and strokes. We have multiple new coagonists and triagonists that are being tested in the clinic. And I'm sure several of these will be more effective than the existing GLP-1 receptor agonists. There are currently phase three trials underway in people with Alzheimer's disease who are being treated with semaglutide orally once daily. And there's considerable evidence from preclinical data that these agents are able to halt the extent of inflammation and attenuate the development of experimental neurodegenerative disease. I've also highlighted for you the potential excitement that we feel for the examination of the therapeutic actions of GLP-1 receptor agonists in people with NASH. Not only do these medicines reduce body weight and decrease hepatic fat, they also decrease inflammation. And we're aware as a community that cardiovascular morbidity and mortality are very important in the life cycle of people with NASH. And we're hopeful that GLP-1 receptor agonists will be meaningful in attenuating the morbidity and mortality that's associated with NASH. Let's see what the clinical trials hold. Finally, I'd like to thank the current members of my laboratory who continue to excite me with their scientific progress, notwithstanding the challenges that we and the entire scientific community have endured during COVID-19. We've also continued to benefit from longstanding funding from CIHR, our national funding agency in Canada, and most recently funding from the Canada-Israel CHR IRDC consortium. Novo Nordisk has been a very uh, generous and longstanding supporter of our work in this field, and they deserve my ongoing thanks. And most recently, Pfizer has supported our work in this area as well. So my thanks go out to the Canada Gardner Foundation and its supporters. We're very grateful for the recognition of our work and our thanks is extremely sincere and boundless. Thank you.